It is seven o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast, and these are our top stories. Monitoring the data. A new assessment of Omicron expected amidst concerns that rising cases could still overwhelm the NHS. What we've seen is nurses being just physically and mentally exhausted. Um, they're being redeployed. They're doing things that they wouldn't normally be doing. The lockdown generation. Growing concerns for the development of children born during the pandemic. Putin's moment with the media, a chance for him to give a carefully choreographed message to his own people and to the West about the state of Russia and his intentions over Ukraine. The weather becoming more unsettled for all of us with milder conditions pushing in from the southwest. And at a quarter to, we'll take another look at the papers with the journalist and author Janelle Aldred and the broadcaster Anne Diamond. Morning all. We are due to get some fresh data on the severity of the Omicron variant of COVID from the UK Health Security Agency later, after two studies suggested it may cause milder illness than the Delta variant. Scientists say the findings are good news, but warn a surge in cases could yet overwhelm the NHS. Well, yesterday saw a record day for COVID cases, with more than 100,000 reported as Wales and Northern Ireland announced further restrictions coming into effect after Christmas. Uh, for his part, Boris Johnson has yet to indicate if he will follow suit in England. Sky's Sadia Chowdhury has our first report. Record new cases in a day and a record number of vaccines administered. The race against COVID is neck and neck. So today you're going to get the Pfizer vaccine. Okay. Um, you get your booster, yeah? You At this GP surgery in Streatham, a sign that the vaccine is gaining support. We've had a lot of people come forward for the first dose now, so I think some of those people that were relying on herd immunity or just hoping to wait it out have realised that COVID is not going anywhere anytime soon. The UK's Health Security Agency has confirmed another 13,581 new cases of the Omicron variant bringing the total number to over 74,000. It's enough to put holiday plans on notice. I am supposed to be going to visit my girlfriend in Romania in January, and that is looking like it might be in January. This year, I'm not even getting embroiled in Christmas. I'm not even getting hung up in the whole thing. Holiday plans up in the air, but some positive news is emerging about hospital stays. A major study from Scotland estimates a 56% reduction in risk of hospitalisation there with Omicron compared to Delta. Researchers in London looking at English data came up with a similar number. Those with Omicron 40 to 45 per cent less likely to spend a night or more in hospital compared to Delta infections. Overall, people were 15 to 20 per cent less likely to go to hospital at all with Omicron in England. But even if it's milder, if the number of cases is high enough, it could still be a problem for an NHS already under strain. So what we've seen is nurses being just physically and mentally exhausted. Um, they're being redeployed. They're doing things that they wouldn't normally be doing. People are trying to cover the work of one, two, three, four colleagues um, that might be missing. Experts have welcomed the research, but urge caution, given how small the sample in the Scotland study is and how early in the Omicron outbreak we are. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News. Well, let's uh, bring you the latest data on coronavirus. Uh, and as mentioned, 106,122 new cases of COVID-19 were reported in the latest 24-hour period. 140 more people have died, taking the total number of those who've lost their lives within 28 days of a positive test to 147,573. Uh, vaccines, well, they did hit a new high yesterday. More than 968,665 boosters and third jabs were given. When you add in first and second jabs, more than a million vaccines given in a single day. Almost 31 million people have now had a third jab or booster. COVID infections among primary school-aged children are estimated to be three times higher than in the general population. The government-backed REACT1 study has found that around 4.5% of 5 to 11-year-olds have the virus. 
compared to just 1.5% across the country. Ah, well, let's bring you a little bit more on the latest COVID data. The REACT1 team from Imperial College London uh, now completing the latest round of their study looking at the prevalence of the virus across the country. Uh, we're joined now by Professor Paul Elliott, Director of the REACT programme and Chair in Epidemiology and Public Health Medicine at Imperial College London. Great to see you uh, this morning, Professor. Um, uh, it is, again, a fascinating piece of research. Let's, let's start with that which everyone has, ha has latched onto. How much more do we know about Omicron? Well, what we've seen in our data is um, that we've had, since the summer, really quite high prevalence, but but pretty steady with the R number around one. Uh, but from the beginning of December, we saw this very dramatic rise in uh, prevalence across the country, but particularly in London, with the R number now substantially above one. So this exponential increase in, in infections, which is absolutely being driven by the Omicron variant. Just in terms of, of what that means in terms of the public health strategy, in terms of the pressure on the NHS, you will have seen, I'm sure, some of the front pages this morning and everyone focusing very, very quickly on the fact that, that it certainly appears that this is significantly, significantly less severe, that there is a reduced chance of hospitalisation uh, as a result. I mean, how confident are we in that? Well, of course, that, that's encouraging news uh, uh, that, that perhaps the uh, infection, when you get it, might be uh, less severe in, in terms of hospitalisation. But of course, with this very, very rapid rise and increase in cases, and, and we've seen the, the national cases go above 100,000, then of course, uh, more cases means more pressure because if, if uh, e even though a smaller proportion might go, get severe disease or go into hospital, that could still result in, in many cases. And of course, that could give pressure on the health service. Of course, I mean, just, just very simply put, despite the fact that Omicron may prove to be significantly less severe in individual kind of health outcomes, that does not mean that the NHS will not be under huge pressure perhaps in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, absolutely the case, because th this rise in, in infections, uh, which we see in our data and is seen also in the uh, testing data through through the national routine testing of people presenting with symptoms means that there are going to be well there are you know many many cases and sadly some of those people may get severe illness and end up in hospital. Uh, of course, this data will assist um, other. Uh, pieces of research, the modelling that are around um, COVID-19 and, of course, the, on the new, the new variant. A number of people are suggesting that the SPI-M models were quite pessimistic. They would need to be revised on the basis of, of, of what you have discovered. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, what we're doing is uh, we're looking actually in real time. So our data was up till um, the 14th of December with some additional... Uh, cases up till the 17th of December, and we're looking in the general population. So we take a random sample of the population of England and ask people to uh, take part and uh, give us a swab and answer some questions about uh, their symptoms and so forth. So we get a, a really good picture of what's happening in the population in real time. And of course, that's extremely helpful. So we're not modelling forward, we're looking at what's happening in the here and now. And in the here and now, as I say, we've seen this very rapid rise in infections, which is being driven by the Omicron variant. Uh, but of course, it will be a, a piece of research that the government would look at in terms of, you know, plotting their, their strategy moving forward. I, I wonder, though, if we could just focus just for a second on, on children, the idea that 4.5% infected there compared to 1.5% nationally. Do we, do we know why that is? Is it simply, you know, the lack of vaccination? Well, we, 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 if we have, a, if you like, a sort of natural experiment because the younger children have not been vaccinated, so this is the primary school age children, whereas the older children from 12 and above have been uh, receiving vaccine and, and in our data certainly uh, a, a good proportion of them have been vaccinated. And very interestingly, what we saw from our previous survey, which ended on the 5th of November, to the current survey, which was between the 23rd of November and the 15th of December, we saw a, a drop by about half of the infection rate in the older school children, um, but the youngest 
children that you're talking about, their prevalence remained about the same, about 5%. So, so we do see the, the real benefits of the vaccination program in those older school children coming through in the data that we're collecting. What, what, does, the, what does the research show about, about those who have yet to be vaccinated? We know that there are parts of London, for example, where perhaps as many as 40% of the population haven't had a single jab. There must be concern about what might be happening there. Yes, certainly in our data, the the real, the really big rise in December with with Omicron has been in London. It's it's sort of in the vanguard, if if you like, of this of this variant. And um, of the ten uh, local small areas, uh, lower tier local authority areas that we're 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 monitoring, of the ten with the highest, eight of those are in London. So we really are seeing this in London. Um, Professor, just uh, whilst we have you, I wonder if I might ask you to kind of remove your professorial hat just for a second. Um, uh, on the basis of the, the research that has been carried out, as we edge into to 2022, past couple of years have been pretty rough for everyone. Are you feeling more or less positive about what might be coming down the track as a result of this? Uh, to be honest, we were, were really quite positive about the rollout of the vaccine programme, which has been obviously a fantastic success. Uh, we are seeing that in our data, not only in the um, uh, secondary school aged children, but actually in older people over the age of 65, we've seen a real drop in infections in that group. Uh, again, reflecting the booster program where most of those people have had a booster. So it was really looking, looking promising. And of course, now we've got this variant and, uh, and this very, very sharp rise in infection. So for the time being, I would say that uh, we, we all have to be a bit cautious and we have to pay attention to the public health message. We have to wear our mask and so forth because, um, you know, the, these are unprecedented levels of infection. They certainly are. Um, Professor Paul Elliott, great to have you on the programme this morning and a very Merry Christmas to you and yours when it comes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, a generation of lockdown babies, children born during the pandemic, are starting to show the impact of their far from ordinary early life. Isolation, lockdowns, even mask wearing, all taking their toll as the children begin their nursery education. And it's feared that language, speech therapy and child development services could be stretched to breaking point. As Sky's Becky Johnson reports. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs who lived with their mother. The story familiar to generations of children. Yeah. Should we count the pigs? One. But for this generation, childhood has so far been very different. Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. <laughs> Too young to remember life before the pandemic. Lockdowns were imposed at a crucial stage in their development. Nurseries, including this one in Birmingham, are seeing the impact. They are you know, slightly delayed in some sort of, in some of their language and communication skills and um, interactions with their peers. So, you know, following rules and boundaries, uh, we've had to do a lot of work, um, you know, with that. What do you need to say? <laughs> Lovely sharing. Through the various lockdowns, children this age have missed out on so many months of normal childhood that they're having to be taught some of the social skills that we normally just expect children will learn through play and interaction. Experts believe it'll have a long-term effect on their education, with disadvantaged children suffering the most. We will see consequences in one form or another that will last for, for years and will impact on their trajectory also of learning in the future. We'd be looking at the, the sentence that the child can say, so the girl is sitting on the box. Speech therapist Stephanie Ropik is having to help children make up for time lost in lockdown. A lot of parents having to work from home and not being able to interact as much with their children during that time, lack of opportunities to play and mix with their peers. In the inner city primary schools where she works, demand has soared. In Birmingham, in the schools I work in, probably seeing 80% of the children start in reception with not age-appropriate language skills. And how does that compare to pre-pandemic? Maybe about 40%. So it's doubled? Yeah. 
and that's, that also that's nearly every child yeah in reception in the schools i work at it is most of the children as evidence builds of the impact on young children the full consequences may not be known for many years becky johnson sky news birmingham the Russian President Vladimir Putin will give his end-of-year news conference this morning, inviting selected, friendly journalists to put questions to him. All coming at a time, of course, of increased tension between Moscow and the West over what NATO believes could be an imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine. Our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magni, uh, joins us now. Good to see you this morning, Diana. It is that most wonderful time of the year, isn't it, when we all sit to find out exactly how long Vladimir Putin is going to talk for. What's the sweepstake in the office saying this year? I say three and a half. My camera's man says four and a half. So I'm hoping that I win this time, but we have no money on it. Um, but you're right that this is a carefully choreographed event with journalists handpicked by the Kremlin this time round. And the fact that, for example, Novia Gazeta, the independent newspaper whose editor just won the Nobel Peace Prize for defense of journalism, has not been accredited, tells you, I think, all you need to know about the state of the free media in Russia. Uh, but, of course, for the West, it will be most significant what President Putin has to say about Ukraine. He made some pretty ominous comments on Tuesday, saying that if NATO does not stop its aggressive stance, and, of course, NATO uh, says that it is purely a defensive uh, organisation, if NATO does not stop its aggressive stance, then Russia will be forced to use military technical means to combat it. And what we believe he means by that, what the Foreign Ministry has uh, suggested he means by that, is the redeployment in Europe or in, on Russian territory of intermediate range missiles, which could, of course, reach European capitals, which were banned under the INF Treaty, but now that that treaty has been dissolved, uh, may start being replaced in Europe. A against the background to all this, of course, is this Russian military buildup across uh, uh, along Russia's border with Ukraine. The concerns in Ukraine and in the West that uh, Vladimir Putin may invade, and these security pro proposals that uh, Russia has published, which set a really very high bar outlining a potential new security architecture that Russia would like to see in Europe. There is a lot in there that clearly won't be realized. Uh, for example, vetoing any future accession of Ukraine to NATO. But there are probably areas where there could be negotiations started on, for example, arms control, military exercises. Negotiations are due to start early Early next year. It will be interesting to see and hugely important, of course, to see whether that is actually what Vladimir Putin uh, wants to achieve, a new security architecture, or whether he does have his sights on invading Ukraine. Uh, much more from you, of course, throughout the morning. Uh, Diana, for now, thanks very much indeed. Uh, other news now. And the jury in the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell has been sent home for the Christmas break. Jurors ended, ended their second full day of deliberations into the sex trafficking trial without reaching a verdict. It means that Maxwell, who was herself born on Christmas Day, will spend her 60th birthday in prison. Nearly half of people say they plan to travel to visit family and friends this Christmas, and that could mean chaos on the roads. There'll be an estimated 10 million journeys today and tomorrow, with it set to be the busiest getaway for five years. A rather different story on the trains, however, expected to be used by only one in ten travellers. Hundreds of trains are actually set to be cancelled because of pandemic-related staff shortages and a strike by the RMT union also likely to lead to the cancellation of many cross-country services tomorrow with further action expected after Christmas. It is a strange world when McDonald's runs out of fries. But they're being forced to ration them in Japan because of a bottleneck in supplies caused by the COVID pandemic. Medium and large servings of McDonald's fries are off the menu. Customers are only allowed just a small portion. The vast majority of women believe that services for conditions only affecting women are given a lower, lower priority by health professionals. Well, today, the government sets out its plans for tackling gender inequality. Uh, joining us now, Sky's Milena Veselinovic, who's in the newsroom. Morning again, Milena. Take us through this. Where's this research from? 
Good morning, Neil. Well, more than 110,000 responses were collected from individual women as well as organisations between June, uh, March and June this year. And they found that 8 in 10 women found that healthcare professionals simply don't listen to them and that the conditions that affect only women are given far less priority than other conditions. Now, two in three women who have a disability or a special condition said that basically uh, the, they don't feel supported by the services available and that the majority of women believed that compulsory training for GPs on women's issues, was, including the menopause, was needed in order for their needs to be met. Now, the Minister for Women's Health, Maria Caulfield, called some of these findings shocking. There are steps that the government is taking to try to improve this, for example, uh, including uh, demographic data or all respondents of research trials into uh, that information. They will also be banning hymenoplasty. Now, that is a, a procedure to restore a woman's hymen. Uh, it is linked to virginity testing, and experts say that it is uh, perpetuating very outdated views on women's sexuality. And furthermore, the government has already pledged to outlaw virginity tests. Melania, thank you. Uh, time to see how the weather is looking as we nudge towards Christmas. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, the unsettled conditions stay with us into Christmas weekend and beyond, with the mild air battling the cold for dominance. It is a chilly start in the north and east. Icy stretches are possible in northern Scotland, uh, but it's much milder in the west. The rain spreads in across Ireland into western parts of the UK and will then merge with the existing rain belt over Scotland, increasing the risk of hill snow. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Ah, well, let's stick with COVID. Could the rising number of Omicron cases lead to a circuit breaker lockdown after Christmas? And would that circuit breaker include closing schools? Uh, we're joined now by George Budd, principal of Morton Hall School in Shropshire. Uh, good to see you this morning, Mr Budd. See, I've already fallen into the habit there of calling you by your teacher's name. George, good to see you this morning. Um, look, we've got plenty to discuss about what, what might be coming down the road in, in 2022, but let, let, let's just start with a few reflections. I mean, how was 2021 for you, your colleagues and your pupils? Morning, Neil. And yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to come on this morning. It was it was a challenging year. I think that we learned an awful lot in 2020, in 2020, the first few months of the pandemic. So that come, you know, come 2020, uh, 2021 with the start of the academic year, we were in a very different place. Uh, in terms of things like switching easily to online learning, uh, sort of you know dealing with the sort of challenges which COVID cropped up. So I think from that point of view, you know every school in the land I think was, would find itself in the same position there. Um, we fortunately, because we're a relatively rural school, we've actually found uh, not a huge amount of disruption this year. I think we've been quite fortunate. Although I know, of course, many of my colleagues running running schools in cities or running schools um, that are not boarding schools, we're we're predominantly a boarding school, have have found things rather different. Um, so it has been a more positive year, and for me, it's really underlying the importance as we've you know we've already heard this morning about 80 percent of reception children joining the uh, joining that class with lower than expected levels of language and I think for me it's it, this year has underlined the importance of keeping our children in school yeah and and just in terms of the of the kids themselves I mean obviously there's been testing for some of them well, there will have been uh, there will be vaccination going on I mean how, how are they coping with this I mean I remember when I was kind of you know my mid-teens if something like this had come had come along it would have knocked us all for six I think you know children are hugely resilient, and I think they adapt very quickly to to changing circumstances. Um, and we've seen that throughout the last eighteen months. You know, when we went online, the the, the resilience and determination of our, our boys and girls to you know, to carry on with their learning and to, to make the best of that situation about which they could do little or nothing um, was really remarkable. And that's continued actually this year. Um, and you know, I think young people are very resilient and very uh, quick to to adapt to changing sets of circumstances. Far more so probably than most of the adults. So in many ways, from that, that point of view, I'm quite optimistic that, and indeed it's been reflected in what we've seen this year, I'm quite optimistic that, you know, the, the sort of normal routine of school life, normal rhythm will come back very quickly. Um, we've actually seen this year, you know, to give you a, a couple of examples, I think that 
the my you know my, my first lacrosse team for example they've been much more a much more knitted group this year than i think than perhaps we'd expected because i think children coming back into school they're so determined to to rekindle those friendships that of course have been so difficult to keep going via a screen um, and I think that's you know, that was one thing that we were worried about. How, you know, how, are, how are children going to reintegrate with each other socially? But actually, we've seen the complete opposite of that. And they've been hugely positive and hugely determined to, you know, to, to, to go back to life as normal. I, I suppose, though, the, the, the dark cloud for any pupil of, of secondary age in or out of a viral pandemic at exams. Now, they are fast looming on the horizon. We've been discussing, of course, potential circuit breakers, potential school lockdowns. I mean, fr from your perspective, could the kids cope? with, with a, a, an extended period away from school again, back onto the remote learning? I think, could they cope? Yes. Is it the right thing for them? No. Uh, you know, children need to be in school for so many reasons. They can learn academically relatively effectively at home. Uh, you know, we can, as we, we, we're in the position now where the government is providing a lot of laptops where schools are geared up for it. And so I think the, you know, for the academic delivery uh, is, is perhaps far easier than it was. Although, of course, there is still huge disparity between um, people of you know people who are, who are more deprived, people who lack access to online uh, education at home, people whose parents are perhaps less available to help them at home. But you know, the bottom line is: could could the children cope? Yes. Is it the best thing for them? Absolutely not. And I think. Um, you know, uh, we, we heard the other day that 90% of people in hospital who are receiving the most care in hospital are unvaccinated. And so I would implore all of the adults who are able to get vaccinated to please go and do so because you know, keep protecting the NHS is often given as the reason why we may have another circuit breaker lockdown. And, you know, learning that 90% of people who are receiving the most care in hospital are in fact unvaccinated, that, you know, people could do something about that. And from a, from the point of view as, as, as a head teacher, as a teacher, I would implore them to do so because that will keep their children in school where they learn the best. Uh, well, George, wishing you, your colleagues, your pupils, all the very best for 2022. And uh, look, have a lovely Christmas when it comes. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Neil. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, time for us to have a quick look at the morning sport. Oh, Whoa! <laughs> Calm down, Johnny. It's only a game. Brought to you by Vitality, <laughs> sharing the benefits of healthy living. And Liverpool needed a great performance from their second-choice goalkeeper to beat Leicester on penalties and thus reach the semi-finals of the League Cup. Quivin Kelleher saved two penalties, including this one from Leicester's Ryan Bertrand and sudden death after the match had ended 3 all. That left Diogo Jota to score the winning penalty. Scream on that one. As Liverpool won the shootout 5-4, setting up a semi-final against Arsenal. Kelleher, well, he's only 23 years old. Meanwhile, in the other semi, Tottenham will face Chelsea. Lucas Moura scoring the winner as Tottenham beat West Ham 2-1 in their quarterfinal. Means that Tottenham boss Antonio Conte faces his old club Chelsea, who beat Brentford 2-0. This own goal, oh, helping them to victory. It is their third semi-final in 11 months. And an absolute shocker from Celtic in the Scottish Premiership. Second place, Celts drawing 0-0 at St Mirren, despite having more than 30 shots on goal. The top division will be taking an early winter break, which will then start after the Boxing Day games. Handball. 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 Ref. Handball. Ref. Coming up next on Breakfast, I'll be speaking to Dame Esther Ranson as an unprecedented number of people face loneliness this Christmas. Welcome back. A leading scientist says that new studies showing the Omicron variant is less severe and less likely to send people to hospital is encouraging news. Professor Paul Elliott, the Chair in Epidemiology and Public Health Medicine at Imperial College London, which published one of the reports. Uh, well, he says the extent of the outbreak could still overwhelm the NHS. This rise in, in infections, uh, which we see in our data and is seen also in the uh, testing data through, through the national routine testing of people presenting with symptoms, means that there are going to be, well, there are, you know, many, many cases. And sadly, some of those people may get severe illness and end up in hospital. Uh, let's bring our 
political correspondent Tamara Cohen from Westminster. Um, Tamara, the, the, the picture being painted there by Professor Elliott, look, we understand why all the front pages this morning are carrying uh, those studies showing that Omicron perhaps less severe than Delta. However, as he makes perfectly clear, there could still be some significant, perhaps even debilitating pressures on the health service. That's right. There is some tentative good news from this imperial study and a separate study in Scotland, which both found that your risk of needing to go to hospital and stay in hospital if you have Omicron is much reduced compared to Delta. So that is great news. However, it is qualified by the fact that Omicron is spreading incredibly fast. So that, that might wipe out all the gains from it being less severe because so many people will get Omicron that you might still have very high numbers of people with severe disease disease having to go to hospital and that threatening to overwhelm the NHS. So what this means in terms of possible restrictions in England, which is the only part of the UK which is where no restrictions after Christmas have been announced. The Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish First Ministers have all announced restrictions from Boxing Day or the day after. But Boris Johnson is holding out um, significantly because members of his cabinet and members of uh, his party are very vocally against restrictions. And many of them will seize on this new data to say, look, perhaps we don't need them. Now, I'm told today by senior sources in government that we do not expect that to change. Boris Johnson is not going to be announcing any more restrictions for after Christmas this week. We will not hear from him about that this week. But of course, uh, they will be assessing very carefully all the hospitalisation data that's coming in to see how fast those hospitalisations are rising. Tamara, thank you. Now, for many of us, the festive season is all about getting together with friends and family and sharing time together. But it's thought that almost one million older people will spend Christmas alone, with a further five million saying the best present they could get this year would be a phone call from a loved one. Dame Esther Ranson, who's founded the Silver Line to offer support to those who need it, joins us on the programme. Esther, it's lovely to see you on the programme this morning. I do hope you're very, very well, but it is a sad topic that you and I will once again reflect on. It can be a very, very lonely time of year for some people. It can, but it is amazing, and it is wonderful news, how much difference a simple bit of technology that looks a bit like this can make. To that Christmas day, I'll be talking to, um, well, probably about 10 people on Christmas day who've asked for a phone call, and I have... Uh, done this for a, um, a number of previous Christmases and I can tell you that the difference in people's voices at the end of a conversation that if you can laugh together about some <clears throat> excuse me some memory of Christmas's past it can make a huge difference to the whole day so I would say if you've got half an hour or so, just pick up the phone and ring someone in your family, someone whom maybe you've known in a, in a past life, an old school friend, an old neighbour, and say that you've been thinking of them and you want to wish them a very good 2022. Um, of course, Esther, you have perhaps done more work than, than most people in this area with, with the silver line. You've offered a reassuring words to, to any number of people of a certain age at this time of year. But it's, what's been fascinating to me this morning is I didn't really know the backstory uh, to the Silver Line. Can you just tell our viewers a little bit about it? Well, <clears throat> when I wrote about um, feelings of loneliness that I was experiencing, I was inundated with letters and I got a file of them here because um, I obviously, obviously I've kept them. But there's one in particular that inspired me from a gentleman called Bob Lowe. He said, I'm 90. My wife died three months ago of Alzheimer's disease after 65 years of marriage, but more to the point, 72 years since we first kissed. And she waited throughout the war for me and I for her. Loneliness, tell me about it. And he included a poem. Well, I was so struck by that amazing letter that I got in touch with him and asked if he'd be prepared when we launched the Soul Line to become our first ambassador. And so at the age of 90, he started on a whole new role, going all over the country and also reading that poem, which went all over the world about his love for Kath and his loneliness at having missed her. Well, he was due to be 100 years old. We were all going to celebrate his birthday 
Tuesday of this week. Alas, he died a couple of weeks ago. Oh. So we celebrated his birthday and had a memorial service this Tuesday. And it was a remarkable event because everybody talked about how much he'd done to counteract the loneliness of older people through his work. And I, I would just like to say two things really, Neil. One is, I think we should all remember people who've lost someone close to them this Christmas, because Christmas time is particularly hard if, like the Queen, you're used to spending it with the closest person in your life and you've lost them. And I remember that the first Christmas after I lost my husband. So I want to say that we're all thinking of people who've lost someone precious to them. And we know it's going to be really tough this Christmas. But I'd also like to say that it's never too late to start a new role, a new career, and have a new adventure. Bob showed it at the age of 90. And my happiness, Neil, is that I was able to see him before he died. And he did say to me, he said, I would have liked to make 100. And I said, Bob, according to the Chinese calendar, you have made 100 because they start with conception. And I think that cheered him up a bit. I think I, I'm sure it did. What, what, what a legacy um, Bob leaves and indeed what a testament and a tribute uh, to the love he had for Kath. Um, Esther, we, ha we have to leave it there, but I wonder, just as we say our goodbyes, I saw you hold up the memorial. The, 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 can we have a quick look at the photo of Bob and Kath that's on the front there? Yes. Absolutely stunning. Dame Esther Ranson, always an absolute pleasure to talk to you. You look after yourself and have a very, very lovely Christmas. Lots of love from all of us here. And the same to you, Neil, and the same to your whole team. And if you know... Any, you or anyone you know is indeed struggling over the festive season and indeed throughout the year. Uh, the number below is for Silverline, 0800 470 80 90. That works to support those who are experiencing loneliness. That number again, 0800 470 80 90. Now, it is set to be the busiest day on the roads as people get away for the holidays with just one in 10 choosing to use public transport. Uh, joining us now, the president of the AA, Edmund King. Edmund, great to see you. I do hope you are well. Um, can, can we just start with why we think the roads are going to be so busy this year? Why are, are so many people seemingly abandoning public transport in favour of getting constantly asked for hours on end, are we there yet? Yes, good morning, Neil. We did a survey of 15,000 people about three weeks ago. And from that survey, we asked them, would they be travelling today, tomorrow, over the Christmas period? And we found about the equivalent of about 18 million drivers would be travelling today and tomorrow to get away. And I think there are a couple of reasons. One is because obviously there were more restrictions in place last year. So many people didn't spend Christmas with their families. But I do think the other reason is people are more cautious of public transport um, with, with the virus out there. And therefore, they feel a bit safer in, in the bubble of their own car. Now, obviously, since we did that survey about three weeks ago, there have been more concerns raised about the virus. So, so I think we, we would slightly downgrade those figures. But even so, I think we'll see the roads getting busier today and then uh, tomorrow, particularly around lunchtime, when, when people rush to get to see family and friends. Yeah, and I suppose, of course, you know, travelling at this time of year, you know, you always have to be mindful of the weather. You know, I've been reading it out all morning and it doesn't look like it's going to be the worst, but, you know, people will be taking roads that they're unfamiliar with, routes that they're unfamiliar with. I mean, what's the best advice before packing the bags into the back of the car and, and stuffing the kids in there as well? Yeah, there's some really good advice because what we actually find, e even with breakdowns, about 40% of people struggle to actually describe where they are. I'm on the A5, I'm going towards Kendall, I went past the quarry about a mile away, but I'm not sure where I am. And what we're saying to people, there's this free uh, app called What Three Words, and it divides the globe in, into seven, uh, 70 trillion uh, three meter squares, and every three meter square has three words that describe where it is. So rather than saying you're near Kendall, if you actually phoned us up and gave the three words stall, 
squeaking and fended, we would know exactly where you are. So we're, we're using that. I think we've used it about 5,000 times in the last week where people haven't known where they are. And, and probably more importantly, for the emergency services, if someone has had a crash, particularly in a remote area, a rural area, knowing the what three words for that area means the emergency services can, can get there quickly. So hopefully that will help in people's preparations. And also we know over the next couple of days, people are still get, getting out there to get booster jabs. So we've just agreed with Grant Shapps and the Department of Transport that we'll put up more AA temporary signs to these community vaccination centers. So, you know, hopefully a little preparation from drivers, preparing the car, preparing themselves, planning their journey before they go, checking traffic before they go, will help lead towards smoother journeys this Christmas. Some very useful advice. Edmund King from the A. lovely to see you again and have a lovely Christmas uh, when you get there. Same to you, Neil. Thank you very much. Uh, stay where you are as we approach quarter two. After the break, we'll be taking another look at the papers with the journalist and author Janelle Aldred and the broadcaster Anne Diamond. That's next. Uh, time to have a look at the papers once again. Uh, joining us to give us their selections, the journalist and author, Janelle Aldred, and the broadcaster, Anne Diamond. Lovely to see you both again. Um, Janelle, to you first this time, because obviously we like to switch it up and about, and it's the front page of the mirror, and this is all to do with those young people who might not have had a jab just yet. No, yeah, and whilst we talked, you know, in the last hour about Omicron being milder for unvaccinated people, people who are for vaccinated people, people who aren't vaccinated, while some of them are facing higher risk, and this says 80% of patients at the Royal Liverpool Hospital are unvaccinated. So it's healthy people, 30s, early 40s, you know, four out of five of their patients haven't had the vaccine. And so although we know it's not as severe as Alpha and Delta Omicron, it's spreading more quickly, which means you're more likely to catch it. And if you're not vaccinated, that can spell trouble. And I think it's, we have to tell the story that two things can be true, that one, it's not as severe as we thought, but two, if you aren't vaccinated, then it can still potentially be deadly for you. And so we, you know, that's the message that I think we really need to keep saying. I mean, and, and as you take us to, to, to the front of the Daily Telegraph, I mean, obviously, last that, well, this hour, we spoke with Professor Paul Elliott from, from Imperial College behind that REACT survey. And, uh, and as Janelle was suggesting, look, it is great. It's positive news that this is not going to have the most severe health outcomes for most people. But if lots of people get it, there could still be an awful lot of pressure on the health service. And that also throws us forward into 2022 and what we do next about potentially a fourth boost, a, a fourth shot in our arms. That's right. I mean, uh, the, those of us who uh, are right up with our vaccines and, and want a lot <laughs> um, uh, sort of could be due uh, or asking whether we are, are going to be due for a second booster. I, for instance, had my booster at the end of September. So at the end of December, just in a few days' time, it'll have been three months. And uh, my age group are all asking themselves, should we be asking for a second booster? And they are bringing out a second booster or, if you like, a fourth dose um, in Israel and Germany. They've got, they're have they going ahead with a fourth booster or fourth dose, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, this report here says that um, they are seriously considering at the JCBI here, uh, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, are seriously considering it now. They're looking for a bit more data, um, but it looks as though they're going to go the same way and say, all right, because what we are, seem to be uh, recognising is that the potency of the vaccine wanes over time. Could be three months, could be four months, when most of us will need a booster booster again. Uh, and if that's true, uh, and if the JCVI do recommend it, then we could be going ahead with that second booster as early as the new year for some. It's already available for people uh, with weakened immunity and other disorders. Um, but for the general population, starting presumably with older people, um, yes, a fourth dose, a second booster could be available in the new year. Yeah, so it certainly feels as if those 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 booster jabs are going to be with us for for many years to come. Um, Janelle, take us inside the Guardian. The article with the headline "Return of the Mat," a reference to one hit wonder Mark Morrison. I mean, that, I don't think that's a reference uh, that many necessarily of the Guardian's readers will get. Tell us about the story, though. 
Well, it's the man that Boris called totally hopeless with an expletive, expletive in there um, in a WhatsApp message last year. So it seems that Matt Hancock is keen on making a comeback. Um, what kind of comeback? We don't know. I mean, he's had the unseeable CCTV embrace. We saw he was at the number 10 cheese and wine gate party, allegedly, although he said he's not clear it's him. And I think if someone's not clear if it's them in a photo, we do wonder in public life what they are capable of. And also he had the job offer at the UN overturned. He was at ITV with Phil and Holly. You know, he's there's something about power that seems to be alluring him and pulling him back. But I think he's had a few more comebacks than Mike Tyson. And I'm not sure whether a full return to a ministerial capacity or full public life is really seriously on the cards for him, although he seems to think it might be. I'm sure Matt Hancock would appreciate being compared to Mike Tyson, of all people. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it just, just, just on this topic, though, Janelle, I mean, is it ever worthwhile for a politician who has suffered such very public and obvious disgrace to try and inveigle their way back into frontline politics? I think he should, if I were him, I would be asking myself some very serious questions really about the um, competency that people might see in me and therefore believe the things that I do and say and take me seriously. You know, we, we want to take our politicians seriously. We want to believe the things that they say. And unfortunately for him, he's been caught in a steady stream of compromising situations where it seems that we can't trust what he says and we can't trust what he does. And so he might want to return to power, but I think the question for every MP and public servant is, is it good for them to be in power? And that's the question I think he should ask himself. Anne, you look, you look like you're pretty settled for Christmas. The decorations are wonderful behind you. Are you, are you, yeah, are you going to be doing, are you going to be doing any driving? It looks like if people are hitting the roads this year, it's going to be very, very busy indeed. It really is. I mean, if you're not already there, get going now, I say, because it really does look as though it's going to be mayhem. And a lot of the newspapers are reflecting that this morning. Um, you've got the busy, apparently it's going to be busiest on the roads for years, probably because a lot of people don't want to take public transport. Uh, they prefer to stay within their own bubble, and that's understandable. And also because they had such a, a, a grotty Christmas last year, unable to get, travel and see friends and family, that this year they are determined to. So it is going to be a very long drive wherever you're going to drive you know take sandwiches and coffee with you or something I don't know make sure you're warm and you've got enough petrol in the car um, because the RAC says 5.3 million people are going to get behind the wheel on Christmas Eve they're already driving today 18 million cars are going to be on the roads over the Christmas weekend and meanwhile I mean if you're thinking of flying and you are aren't you yeah. um, Heathrow Airport's going to be pretty awful because it is actually going to be cut off from tube and train links over the weekend because of rail works meanwhile you've also got industrial access on the trains that are running or are not running now um, and uh, 16 trains a day have been taken out um, until Christmas Eve because of Covid shortages so uh, it is going to be hell on the roads uh, and travelling anywhere this weekend so set off early and imagine the worst prepare for the worst <laughs> Um, well, well, thank, thank, thank you, Anne, for depressing the hell out of all of us. Uh, Janelle, why don't you improve our mood by giving us the story of a sausage dog who balances things in his head? Great story, this. So this is the content that I think we need this Christmas to cheer us all up. Sausage dog Harzo, he, he poses like elf on a shelf on his head. Um, he also recreates, well, I don't think he does his own as help him to recreate, <laughs> the iconic Love Actually film scene. And... I think people are agreed that he's the content that we need because he's got 200,000 followers on Instagram. That's way more than me. So, so clearly him in all of these poses is causing us lots of fun. And I think um, in a tough year and a tough Christmas, uh, these kind of fun pictures are always going to raise a bit of a smile. His name is Harlzo. And I have to say, just looking at the pictures there, I'm going to gently suggest that I don't think he's entirely happy with this. I think he looks quite annoyed. And sausage dogs, I've nearly lost a finger to them a couple of times over the years. Um, Janelle, and we will see you again in the 8 o'clock hour. Brilliant selection there. We'll see you in just a few minutes' time. Uh, but you can stay right where you are. Coming up after the break, we will again be reflecting on that new research suggesting that Omicron may be significantly less severe in its health outcomes than Delta. <laughs>